the pandemic is exacerbating issues, existing issues, as we know, uh, with health professional burnout and joy in work. And it will likely persist once the more immediate waves of the crisis have abated. Uh, while many staff are currently experiencing distress related to their work, others are not, but they're at risk of mental health sequelae in the future as the pandemic response continues. Uh, early results from AMA, the Mini-Z assessment for COVID-19 related worker stress showed actually a surprisingly low number of staff reporting symptoms of poor mental health. And we've heard similarly from our colleague Srijan Sen, who's at the University of Michigan, He's been assessing this in medical residents. And so we hypothesize there's this population of staff who are currently operating in crisis mode and are not fully absorbing or experiencing the adverse effects from the pandemic, but who over time will begin to show signs of psychological distress and trauma, including some of us. Um, over the past 60 days, our innovation team here at IHI and our Joy and Work portfolio identified system level strategies for leaders to provide immediate support for their staff's mental health and well-being during the pandemic, which we're calling psychological PPE. Uh, the strategies focus on leadership behaviors and actions to support staff, like reducing fear and anxiety, promoting psychological safety, facilitating peer support and connections. These behaviors and actions will continue to be critical as the pandemic continues and more staff need mental health support. And it's why we're going to dive into more of these topics today. Uh, this is our fifth installment in the Caring for Caregivers special series presented by IHI in partnership with Wellbeing Trust. And today we're zeroing in on some of these strategies with the help of uh, Dr. Arpan Wagre, who's a geriatric psychiatrist. He serves as chief medical officer of the Wellbeing Trust. He's the executive medical director for behavioral medicine at Swedish Health Services. And he's responsible for making this webinar series and our work together possible. Um, Dr. Justin Coffey, he serves as chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Geisinger. He's a neuropsychiatrist. He's worked with IJ for many years. Um, he's internationally recognized uh, expert in suicide prevention, prevention and leads the Zero Suicides Initiative. Uh, Kezia Imbia, she's a research assistant here at the innovation team at IHI, which serves as the organization's sort of internal engine for research and development of new care models. And, and she's helped to review uh, available evidence for interventions to protect staff mental health. So she's going to present that for you today. And finally, Don Berwick. He's been a regular co-chair of the series, so you likely know him. Um, but he's IHI's founder and former administrator of CMS in addition to many other things, which you can see here. Uh, thank you, panel, for making the time to be here today. All right, let's get started. Don, um, if I could ask you to kick us off, uh, you've written a bit about this topic recently, citing conversations with your daughter, who's also a physician herself, um, and your concerns about the healthcare workforce's mental health. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit actually with also your policy hat on um, why is the healthcare workforce mental health important and what do you see as the magnitude of this problem in the US and globally? Thanks, Jessica, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're joining us in this midsummer session. And it's a real pleasure to join Kezia and Justin and Arpan in this uh, important topic. I've known uh, uh, our guests for a long time, and I want to make a special shout out to Justin Coffey, whose work on zero suicide has been world leading. And if it, you haven't studied it, you should. We should probably get some links up about that work. Uh, yeah, it's a massive issue. Uh, we were reminded at an earlier webinar by former Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, Dr. Nicole Lurie, that every disaster brings with it a second disaster. The first is whatever this insult is, in this case, COVID-19 and the tragedies associated with it. And the second is the behavioral health responses, which occur both in the community and in the workforce. And yes, my daughter is a doctor in, uh, she's a hospitalist in a Boston area hospital and uh, she's doing okay, but I can see the toll taken on her and many of her colleagues by the stresses of dealing with this uh, dread disease, uh, the, the, the deaths and despair around her and by the risks that she and her colleagues are incurring every day. She goes to work knowing that she's exposing herself and her family to very serious risks. She sticks with it and she's doing fine, but one should not underestimate the stress that that takes. My daughter is lucky that she has a very strong social support system. That's not true of every healthcare worker. And indeed, we have to remember that the vast majority of healthcare workers are not people of high income. They're not people who have the prestige of being 
physicians or nurses. They're people who work to keep the hospital going. Uh, they're the people that serving the food and cleaning the cleaning the rooms and supporting the clinical staff. And we now know that they are under tremendous stress, uh, including uh, the stress of the economic the economic downturn because hospitals are not immune from the economic downturn. And many many healthcare workers, for example, don't even have health insurance. Um, we also know that the uh, inequity, the racial inequity that we're more and more aware of in the George Floyd era, but should have been aware of all along selectively affecting African Americans and Latino populations and our Native Americans. And those are heavily represented in the workforce at lower levels of income. And that's other special kinds of stress. So this is crucial. And just like everything else we do in improvement, we need to bring science to bear. We need to understand what it is that actually helps get the data, get the resources in place and use the methods of improvement to bring those resources to the benefit of the healthcare workforce. Uh, so we are joined by experts today. I'm going to get out of their way, uh, but I think we're, we're tuned into a, a very important topic, and I want to especially acknowledge the Wellbeing Trust for this partnership throughout this series and also today. Back to you, Jessica, and thank you very much. Thank you, Don. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Kezia, actually. Kezia, can you speak to us a little bit about this concept of psychological PPE and the kind of individual and systems level actions that unit and team leaders can can use to provide protection and support for, for staff and mental health? What are we looking sure. at? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much, Jess, for inviting me. And thank you to the Wellbeing Trust for putting this panel together. I think the way you outlined it in the beginning, Jess, is kind of what uh, sparked this project. So as you said, you know, the beginning of COVID-19 was really exacerbating these issues around professional healthcare professional burnout and joy in work. Um, and we saw this concern around healthcare, how healthcare workers were feeling with the effects of the stressful situation caused, caused by COVID-19. But we also thought, you know, there are some healthcare workers who are operating in crisis mode and down the line, they could start to exhibit um, just traits of reckoning with the adverse consequences of the pandemic. So this uh, tool of psychological PPEs is in direct response to those concerns. It's a strategy for individual healthcare workers and their teams to help protect the mental health, um, uh, protect their mental health in the face of extreme working conditions. So in the same way we use or physical PPE to protect healthcare workers from COVID-19, psychological PPE can be used to protect them from mental health consequences of engaging in the stressful working environments brought about by the pandemic. So this tool is the result of our team reviewing evidence around mental health strategies used by others who have endured extreme working conditions, such as those who are responding to natural and man-made disasters, those who responded to terrorist attacks, and those working in previous pandemics, such as SARS. So as you can see on this slide, it's divided into actions that can be taken on an individual and a team level. It's not a checklist per se, but it's more like a menu of evidence-based options that can be used in various environments. And I also want to recognize and emphasize that system level support from healthcare system and department leaders is necessary to make space for team members so that they, are, they feel free to be able to take care of themselves while they're on the job and also as they step away. So our hope is that healthcare workers and their teams would look at this tool, look at psychological PPE, and implement one or several of the interventions um, in order to just take that step to protect themselves and get ahead of this problem before it becomes a bigger issue. So we encourage you to look at the website. I think Vicki has already posted uh, the link in there, but I hope it's helpful to everyone. Thank you, Kezia. Yes, as you said, the the website that Vicki shared with everyone has the research that Kezia did behind it. So I, you know, sometimes you look at something like this and you're like, okay, I'm gonna take a day off. Sure, thanks, that's helpful. Um, but you can actually see, okay, how did some health systems do this? What did they do? What did they make this uh, actually look like for them? So there's a little bit more detail, but um, really love this, hope it's helpful to folks. And thank you, Kezia, we can talk more about this. Um, Justin, actually, we spoke about this issue in May, and you were originally the one who prompted this idea for psychological PPE. Um, you were saying we need to think about solutions that are opt out instead of opt in uh, from a leadership perspective, because uh, like leadership rounds or intentionally reaching out to direct reports who are home or who are quarantined and really building this into the existing process um, to kind of normalize 
mental health and reach people who might not access traditional mental health services. Um, why is that? Can you share a little bit more about your thinking? Thank you so much, Jessica. And I'm delighted to be a part of this panel to see some good friends and, and folks that I've learned from and learned with uh, over the years. Um, I, I share the perspective that, that Don summarized at the outset that COVID-19 is it's really been a test of our healthcare uh, systems as, as learning systems. Uh, it's been a test of our individual resilience. Um, healthcare workers have been consumed with new challenges at work and then they go home to face new challenges there with their loved ones. Um, we've asked for our leaders to think about how we can make it easier uh, on our teams to access their, their own resilience. And what we've learned is the value of simplification, the, the value of, of ritual, if you will, the, the donning and doffing of PPE uh, is something that is automated in so many of us that work in healthcare institutions and maybe there's some way we can apply that ritual to our own psychological well-being. We, um, we believe that uh, keeping our focus on, for us, what we call true north is, is really, really helpful in this regard. And, and for us, uh, our true north is something that we call our, our three Ps. And we go back to this over and over and over again. Um, in, in order to be successful, we know that we have to do three things in healthcare. We, we have to take care of our patients, we have to take care of our people, and we have to take care of our pennies. Uh, and that's particularly relevant in behavioral health because we make pennies instead of dollars uh, in that specialty. Um, but we know if we're focusing on these three things and we believe in this order of priority, that no matter what's going on, we will be focused on the right thing. And uh, during the pandemic, what we've realized is that the three Ps is probably too much for each member of our team. And we've encouraged and had some success with inviting people to focus on one of these three Ps. And so if you uh, go to the, the next slide, it'll just show you some examples of specific roles that we've created. So when we think about taking care of our patients, we, we've actually assigned some of our frontline caregivers to be what we call enablers. So there are folks that enabled a rapid shift to a virtual first ambulatory enterprise. Um, these were clinicians who were part of a large, large group of clinicians that very quickly realized they were all doing uh, some work to make sure that the virtual platforms were working. But really, if we had dedicated a small number of people to that role, they could do the learning and share that learning much more rapidly and effectively with the larger team. We took some folks and dedicated them to the emergency department to make sure we were enabling um, the emergency department in a way that was so critical, not only to the safety of the care of patients that were coming through the EDs, but also the, the emergency medicine staff that were there. We then thought about taking care of our people as very, very specific goal for some of our uh, consultation liaison clinicians. And so we divided that team really into two, the folks that were gonna continue to see the patients and then a dedicated service that was going to carry out wellness rounds. So rather than responding to consultations for patients in the hospital, they would proactively round on the units in the hospital and see how the nurses and the doctors and the staff were doing. And then we, we assigned specific roles to, to our finance team and our uh, operations partners. Their jobs became to, again, do the job they do each day, but also to be our celebrators. So when the team was focusing on ensuring access during the pandemic, the communicators and celebrators had the responsibility of publicizing and socializing the impact uh, that that work was having on the uh, access, on the financial bottom line, and other important key performance indicators. So it hasn't always been elegant, but you know sometimes uh, life is messy, and we um, we have just doubled down on this framework of of our three P's, and I think. Keeping that focus on True North is something that has resonated with so many of us that have, have a calling in healthcare. 
there's so many places here I want to dig in more and, and learn more about, like the idea of raising up the role of administrators who have a really tough job right now um, and pairing it with a, a function of celebration is really innovative and gives a space for more, I think, co-creation. Um, is that something you've seen and, and what has been the reception of that? We have found that to be the case, Jess. The, um, the folks that um, especially were assigned to remote working, right? The, the non-patient facing folks were some of the first to begin working from home. And they immediately felt socially disconnected at a time when we were trying to overcome physical distancing with remaining socially connected. When our administrative partners took on this responsibility and understood how important it was to the psychological well-being and therefore to the safety and quality of the care that our frontline staff were providing, they really got into it um, and you know had fun leveraging their own skill set, which is you know creating charts and slides that convey data in ways that uh, celebrate the work that people do every day. So we didn't find it to be a hard sell, but again, the first step was the most important, giving everybody very specific defined role and inviting them to create that role in a way that, again, helped them focus on true north. And I would just add that that also helped people not focus on other things. So if I was assigned to be a tele-enabler, I could also rest assured that someone else was assigned to be a wellness rounder and would check on me. So I didn't have to somehow figure out or create the bandwidth to do it all myself. Yeah, yeah, there's an entire team. That's really essential. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I know folks are gonna have more questions for you. So I'll, I'll circle back to them in a bit. I wanna um, pivot if we could, Arpan, I know, Providence St. Joseph's health system is massive. I think there's 120,000 caregivers, maybe 100,000 dependents. Um, how has Providence uh, responded to meet the needs of the this wide workforce? And I know you have a stress meter. You've been really proactive about kind of upstream self-help tools. So I'm wondering, can you share a little bit more with us about them? Sure, thank you so much, Jessica. And uh, it's just such an honor to be a part of, of this panel. Um, so, you know, in addition to having a large workforce, Providence, we were, we we admitted the first COVID patient in the United States, and uh, our system had to deal with uh, a lot very early. Now, luckily, we have very strong, committed senior leaders, and I see Joanne Roberts chatting in there, Dr. Amy Compton Phillips, who started this process. Like as this started, they, they made a strong commitment that the emotional well-being uh, of our workforce is not just a priority. Rather, it's a precondition for us to deliver excellence. And this was brought in to the command center discussions right from the very beginning. Uh, so we started off by doing two things. One was, you know, how do we create, have a system in place to seamlessly guide um, and ensure access to, uh, for mental health and well-being, emotional well-being resources to all our caregivers? And, and really underscoring what Don called out earlier, it's clinical teams and support staff it was really, really important to ensure that we have abroad and their dependents. Um, so based on their needs and preference. So that was that was task number one. And then the second was to proactively reach out to our core leaders uh, and provide them with the tools they, they need to support themselves and their teams. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the first part of it. So, you know, by th I think it was the end of March where we we partnered with our digital innovation group and, and put together uh, this interactive tool, which ended up getting called stress meter. It was just using the subjective units of distress scale, very simple. But the idea was that you know, there people are overwhelmed. There are a lot of resources. How do we bring everything in one place and make it simple? So, um, you know, over that time, over the last several months, about 10,500 of our caregivers have used the tool. Uh, and I'll walk through some of the things that people have found helpful and how this works. So like if you click on, on mild or moderate, now this is not, this version over here is not interactive, but if you, if you click on the mild uh, or, or moderate, uh, you know, stress level, you have certain resources that, that come up and then based on your preference, you could choose. So, you know, and, and this was built with partnerships, external and internal. 
Um, so we, you know, for example, if someone were to click, say, mild stress, and, and their preference is to find self-help resources. Uh, so rather than being either over or underwhelmed by what's available you know, through a, a search engine, uh, we partnered with, uh, with Credible Mind. Uh, and and um, what you can do over here, say, once you get there, you say, I, I want help with, say, anxiety or, or parenting during a pandemic. And my preferred medium of learning is a podcast or a video, whatever it might be. And now you have like a Yelp, like five star rating that comes up with, um, which is based on algorithms uh, from expert opinion. These are folks who, you know, uh, are well renowned in the academic world who, who built, um, you know, um, uh, Medscape and, and WebMD and so on. So, so you have these five star ratings based on the, on the expert uh, input and then the user. So we found that helpful. Interestingly, the most commonly viewed topic over the last several months has been compassion fatigue. Uh, in this particular module. Uh, we partnered with this Irish company, Silver Cloud, that delivers computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, and they helped rapidly create modules for us with coping for stress and building resilience. Uh, what's interesting is we found that when caregivers went here and chose this and, and signed up, they actually spent on an average two hours and 31 minutes, so there were four sessions. People were engaged, they found hopefully some value out of this. And we found that the bounce rates were very low. People, when they went on, they were engaged. Um, we found that tele-spiritual health was one of the most common uh, used resources for people who rated themselves in the mild and moderate uh, range. We found that uh, um, you know, a lot of parents were concerned uh, about talking to their kids. So uh, there's an internal program that we had put together. And some of this work was happening prior to COVID, but COVID accelerated everything for us. Uh, so we, we have a program called Work to Be Well, uh, which has all kinds of practical tips and toolkits uh, for teens and parents. So talking to your children to help them cope with uh, changes uh, that are resulting from COVID. So, so many uh, very, you know, practical things along those lines. Now, w one of the most successful parts of this program was, was the Behavioral Health Concierge, because we realized that even if you had all these resources, people uh, wanted at times to speak with someone. And it was absolutely essential for us to make sure that same day access to a trained therapist was available. Um, so we created this program called Behavioral Health Concierge, um, and um, and it's you know it's interesting. Uh, most people uh, have have got access the same day. We've had 2,945 visits, serving you know 800, 850 of our caregivers, and and a few things that jumped out to me. And there are a lot of stories, but you know people have consistently rated you know the, this uh, the high net promoter score. But but these are healthcare workers. One would imagine that they're uh, somewhat more sophisticated consumers of healthcare than 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 you know the rest of the general population, and yet 46% of them consistently said that without the service they would not have sought help for themselves or would not have known how to seek help for themselves. Now, like every other health system, we have EAPs and all that good stuff forever. Um, yet this is something you know that's come up over and over again, and this is you know some of the feedback that we've received, and you know just very, very powerful stories, and I have so many of them, uh, and that really motivates us to, to stay with this. Is there, I'm, I'm just gonna raise up right away, Arpan, thank you for that. A question from Gina, is there a cost to all of these resources? Did you develop most of them in-house? So we developed, no, that's a great question. Uh, luckily for us, um, you know, these partners engaged, uh, and COVID was such a time where people got together. So there was actually in, in this particular uh, work, we did not have to, uh, you know, Silver Cloud gave, made these resources available to us for free as did Credible Mind. So we did not have to incur any costs. Now there might be costs down the road, depending on, on how successful and how much this is utilized. And we built right. a lot of programs internally as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I also, I'm just gonna start to hop into some of the questions here. I want reflections from Don. There's so much to dig in on. You you both have led a whole host of uh, responses that I think folks could um, want to learn more about. So one of the questions we got is from um, Joanne Roberts. She's curious, Kezia, uh, there's a third column that we've elected not to include here around psychological PPE. There's the individual, there's the team leader, and there's the system. Can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, so when we were developing this tool, we were just very conscious of the fact that 
um, you know, uh, teams and individuals needed to be able to have these conversations as a unit. And so we intentionally looked at the individual and team leader um, actions that could be taken. But I do want to say that um, one of my colleagues, Mara Laterman, as well as Jess, have written a piece about the system level, um, things that can be uh, implemented, uh, the considerations that need to be taken on the system level. So I can drop that chat or that link in the chat. But um, yes, we were conscious of Oh, I think you already did it. Awesome. <laughs> so good. Yeah, but I do want to acknowledge that that is something we thought about, but we wanted to focus on individual and team leader um, actions because in our research, we saw that that's just as important and um, wanted to give the tools for teams to be able to have those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually hesitant to even get into an individual space pre COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly when we're talking about joy and well-being, because so much of the response tends to be putting the burden on the individual. Um, and when 60% of all of your MDs are burnout, you don't have an individual problem, you have a system problem. And exactly. so I would agree with you, Joanne, that's where the energy should be. And right now we're seeing more than ever folks are looking for, how do I put my oxygen mask on first right now while I'm taking care of other people? So. It's grateful for Kezia's work here to augment that. Um, another question was from Gina, I think for Justin, uh, I can go to your slides, but she's wondering, um, are the roles created on each unit or are they hospital wide? Yes, I think is the answer. Um, we, we try to push decision-making down to as close to the front line as possible. Uh, so we could have role defining take place within the clinical microsystem as opposed to, you know, a meso system or, or macro system level. Um, so I think um, uh, at the hospital level, I would say is, is at least how we began talking about these, uh, these roles, but they took on different forms and different permutations, you know, within each of the teams. So uh, the, the goal here was to bring resilience to people rather than rely on them having to ask for it or recognize the need and then go out and, and seek it. We, we had some powerful interactions with folks doing wellness rounds where we would ask them a simple question, are you okay? And they would be donning PPE while they were telling us the answer to that question. Um, it was auto automatic for them. Uh, this ritual of, of donning and doffing. And we had this idea that it needs to be that automatic, it needs to be that kind of a, a you know, primal. Uh, so folks know, hey, if I do these things, I'm going to be okay. Can you share with us just personally, what is your, what do you don and doff every day? You're taking care of people, you're a psychiatrist, you're a leader. What are your habits? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for asking. Um, I'll tell you, I, I adopt so many habits uh, and tools and tricks from content I've learned from IHI over the years. So uh, anything that I do, probably the credit goes to uh, uh, someone like Don or, or Maureen. One of the things I, I begin every day by doing is asking myself what's most important. Uh, and I take just a few minutes to ask myself what's most important and then am I spending my time on what I just offered as the answer to that question. Um, the second thing that I do every day is I take, again, just a couple of minutes at the end of the day uh, and try to do um, a, a homegrown meditation type exercise to just clear my mind so that when I go home, I'm fully present when I get home. That's, that's a pretty uh, ritualized donning and doffing for me personally. I think different folks have, um, uh, different um, different strategies. A lot of folks use exercise or or social interactions um, the same way that you know they wash their hands one more time before they leave the facility. Um, are, are, so I'm getting so many questions here. I want to get to you, Don. Too. Um, one more question for Justin. Uh, have you found that different ways of asking "Are you okay?" work better than others? I would suspect that many healthcare workers would answer, "I'm fine." Um, I don't have a scientific answer to that question, but I can share uh, an anecdote or two. We, we have found that um, uh, there's probably a pattern 
where the degree of relationship facilitates more open dialogue. So instead of a different person rounding, doing wellness rounds in the pediatric ICU each day, if the same person goes back, or better yet, if it's a, a pediatric mental health member of our team that may know some of the pediatric ICU providers, it becomes a, a, a peer support type of dynamic, uh, and that may facilitate more open kind of dialogue. But we've also had experiences where we get a quick email from somebody that says, someone from your team just came by, asked me if I was okay. I said yes, but thank you so much for asking. <laughs> so I think there's some value in, in, in just asking the question. I think there's a lot of resilience in healthcare workers, uh, and it's a matter of calling attention to it, celebrating it, and, and bolstering it. Thank you for that. I'm going to um, pivot to you, Don, and actually I'm going to do that with Stephanie's question as well. Um, I think it might be uh, uh, something you can speak to from your experience. So what are you anticipating given the relentless increase in numbers as we move into the flu season? What else might need to be different? Of course, there's other things going on um, besides the pandemic right now. We have in the U.S. an upcoming election. Um, there are many stressors on folks. And, and how are you anticipating we might need to respond or anticipate? Well, my crystal ball isn't any clearer than anyone else's, but I must say all the signals I'm seeing suggest we're going to have a serious uh, resurgence of this disease. There are places already, of course, that are reeling in Georgia and Florida and so on, but I think even communities that have done well are going to be hitting a real serious problem. We still have not organized testing in this country as a strategy, and uh, every other successful country has had totally different level of surveillance. So I think we're going to get hit, hit again and probably pretty hard. I hope not. Uh, and we better get ready. This time we don't need to be on our heels about it. We can we can be talking about it and assuming it and getting getting as ready as we can. As far as the stressors, um, I think the school opening issue is absolutely key. There are so many families that are going to have to be bearing this burden that schools have heroically taken for years and well, for as, until COVID uh, of of essentially nurturing our children for us on our behalf. And now they'll be home, I think, I'm afraid. I think schools will open, but then I think they'll probably have to close again. So we've got to get ready. And I think that um, the kind of uh, outreach that you're hearing from our guests uh, needs to become serious for the long haul. This is not going to go away fast. And if I can ask one question back to our guests, uh, building on, on some of what you said, Jess, um, in several of these conferences, uh, there's been a background of a uh, question around heroism and stiff upper lip. And I must say macho views that the healthcare workforce is taught to have about itself. I can take this, I've got the burden, I'm strong and I will, I will do this. And um, I, I wonder if, if, um, if uh, Justin and Arpan and Kezia could speak to that, but have you run into that? And is part of this helping people realize that, getting help isn't weakness, it's actually strength. Absolutely, I'll, I'll jump right in on that one. I, I've thought a lot about heroism, Don, because I, I find it to be problematic in healthcare, at least to the degree that uh, so many of us hold it as a value. Um, I, I like to put my trust in processes rather than, than heroism, but there's a fine line here because a lot of folks go into medicine um, because of a sense of calling. I think that um, what led us to start thinking about opting out strategies as opposed to opting in was this very vulnerability that we perceive heroism to be creating among some of our team. There was a sense that the folks who w looked for resources, accessed those resources, were probably the ones that we needed to worry less about compared to the ones that either didn't recognize the need or recognize the need, but didn't feel comfortable to reach out or uh, heaven forbid, didn't know where to reach out to get some support. And so that's why I think some of the idea of bringing these resources to folks, making it more of this opt out um, was a big driver for us. Arpan, what, what was your team's experience? Uh, very similar. I love that question. And and so I'll share an anecdote. It's interesting. Just like Justin, um, 
a vast majority of my learning has been through IHI. And, you know, I have things over here on my table from Don, Don's uh, speech about 2003. So, uh, but, but I'll give you an example of, of one, one thing that happened. So um, I was talking to Maureen um, one morning and she shared with me that in Norway, uh, she heard that there was a, a practice that was in place where the nursing staff at the, F, at the end of every shift uh, in their huddle would uh, have an exercise where they talked about the one thing that made them smile on that shift. And she said she thought that was, you know, really interesting. And, and so that was that was in my mind. And then I go and um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I did exactly what Justin said. And I went to one of our ICU units uh, and I, I asked everyone. I was just talking, checking in with people, asking them how they were doing. And every single one of them said they were absolutely fine. I mean, there was like nothing going on. And this is like a unit where we have multiple COVID patients. There's a lot of stress. They're working long hours. Many of them are not even going back home uh, because they're scared of infecting their loved ones. So um, I tried what Maureen did. I said, can you please, you know, indulge with me? Let me allow you, you know, to participate in, in this. And and at the end of the shift, uh, we, we tried this one exercise where we went around and we asked like, what was the one thing that made you smile? And I can say that it was one of the richest experiences I've had. People were crying, they were talking. Uh, a lot of the negative uh, framing uh, changed to positive. There was so much that happened, and I think that's why when when Justin keeps saying, you know, we should we should have people have to opt out as opposed to opt in, it resonates very very strongly. The heroes will not seek help. We need to bring it to them, and it has to be a part of their regular workday, not one additional thing. So in the huddles, um, that's where it worked really really well. Arpan, do you remember one story as an image of something somebody shared? You know, it's in, yes. <laughs> so thanks, Don. So w w one one nurse uh, had a patient who she was caring for who had uh, who had significant cognitive impairment um, and was not able to follow through with what was being told or, or you know, and expected of him. And he would keep walking out of the room, and and it had taken a very um, very significant toll on her. So when I asked her initially, she you know brushed it off as though it was nothing, the hero attitude, but then she started, you know, saying that this really stressed me out. I had to go in 15 times. I was concerned. But then, um, we, because the conversation was, what was the one thing that made you smile? So then she shared um, a little incident that happened and how, you know, she did a FaceTime call with with him and and uh, and I think a, a, a niece or someone, and, and that just made her um, feel so good about everything she was doing and forgot about the 20 times that the call bell was going off that she had to run in and, and everything was really worth it. Thank you for that. You actually have a specific follow-up question from Brenda and Joyce, somewhat related about critical incident stress debriefing. So Joyce says um, trauma specialists like Bruce Perry uh, recommend building stress recovery breaks into the day and offering reflective supervision. Is this being implemented anywhere that you know of, or are leaders learning how to self-regulate their nervous system so that they can then show up and co-regulate with their team members? We know that emotional contagion is real. It's a beautiful question, and um, I don't know of any place where, where it's being done really well. I know that's an aspirational state for us, for sure, uh, Justin. You're on mute, Justin. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, th there's a there's a literature uh, to support the application of critical incident stress debriefing, and it, it's um, I think surprisingly gray. Uh, there is potential for for harm uh, if if that literature isn't um, read through thoughtfully. What um, what I would say is. Um, um, Helping people think about this issue in language that they can relate to is a tactic that we found useful. So um, we, not, we don't want to try to discourage people from feeling heroic because what they're doing is heroic. At the same time, uh, we can talk about adrenaline and we can talk about how helpful adrenaline can be if you're running a sprint and then help people understand that we're running a marathon. Uh, and adrenaline will only get you through the first mile or two of a marathon. And it, it, it is not a, a moral choice 
or a sign of how much training you did if your adrenaline tank uh, runs out. And we can also use our kind of behavioral health neuroscience backgrounds and help people understand how the fight or flight response impacts our ability to perform at a high level during this time. It, it, it was helpful to talk to some of the folks who were present during the early days of the HIV um, epidemic in the 1980s, where like um, coronavirus, uh, it was a new and frightening virus. And when our brains are frightened, uh, we have a fight or flight response that's triggered in our amygdala, a small structure and deep in our brainstem. We can't control that response. What we know about that response is that uh, it protects us and it evolved to protect us. And one way it protects us is by taking a lot of our higher order thinking and reasoning offline when we need to fight or, or flee. And using those kinds of you know, uh, uh, terms and kind of clinical scientific language to help people understand, hey, look, you know, your brain is going to function the way it functions. And if you're, if you're anxious, if you're nervous, if you're frightened, and all those feelings are probably appropriate, you know, based on the work that you're doing, we can bring resources to you to dampen down that fight or flight response so that your higher order functioning systems can get back online and you can get back to the work that you're really good and heroic at doing. Incredibly helpful. Um, I chatted in a link to this book, Power of Bad, which talks about the negativity effect and for us lay people, <laughs> it's a, a helpful resource. It was for me of understanding a lot of what you're talking about here. Don, you have That's a question. Really yeah, go ahead. Just, just, just a brief point on that, because you're making a, uh, a point there that's really important, although you were casual about making it. And I think one of the challenges, one of the things our Pons team has done so effectively is not made this uh, feel or come across as psychobabble that only the behavioral health people could somehow deploy throughout a healthcare system. This, this is, I think, about leadership and about taking care of one another. Um, and so the way Arpon described his team building in um, this type of discussion at the system preparedness huddles, you know, th this was not a Department of Psychiatry initiative uh, at Arpon's institution. This was what a healthcare organization needs to do to take care of its people. And I, I, I commend that approach. Thank you. There's a question here for Don from um, Khadija. Uh, if we get used to virtual work and virtual learning, how would it affect psychologically uh, to go back to real life things, switching from virtual to real? I don't know if I, I got that right, uh, Khadija. I, I hear it. Um, I noticed Joanne Roberts is on the chat actively. She may want to comment on that because she has to manage that. Um, I uh, I don't know. I think that the most of the betting is now that the virtual worlds we're experiencing, not just in healthcare, but in many other domains, isn't going to go away at all completely. That these are, in fact, in some ways, better ways to relate to each other, to give care, more uh, lower costs, more instant contacts. And I think we're going to learn over time a balance between what we want to keep in that virtual world and what we want to return to in terms of uh, the more intimate contacts of face-to-face Counters, but I think it is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge, by the way, in one way, uh, in business terms, because we built a healthcare system whose whole financing structure is built is centered on encounters and visits and admissions and physical spaces, and uh, and capital is devoted to that as well. So if we just if we do end up with a healthcare system that's much more it takes that ex kind of positively exploits these new competences, we're going to have to figure out how to, how that should work in terms of our financial structures, but I think it will be a very challenging transition. And uh, I think, by the way, the only solace in this, I think education is going to have a tougher transition. I think this is going to be harder for that system because they have fewer resources to play around with. I don't know if Joanne wants to speak about that. Um, Jess, I don't want to force that. Yeah. Issue, yeah. Um, I wonder if we can, do we have the functionality to unmute an individual, Julia? Well, maybe not. Oh, we don't. It's too bad. Well, Joanne will chat in. I'm sure her thoughts. All right. Yeah, I don't mind. Not how events works. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you, Joanne, in advance for your chat coaching. Um, 
I want to ask each of you in our remaining moments together, just, just if, what's the next thing anyone listening should do with what they've learned today? And uh, who should they speak with next? I'll just make a, um, a ploy for wellness rounding. I think this is something that's easily adopted the, the moment this webinar ends. Um, they're looking in the chat, there's some great suggestions for one or two questions that anybody could ask. You don't have to be a behavioral health clinician, you don't have to be in a leadership role, all you have to do is be a healthcare worker. If you could leave here today and go ask three people um, you know, one of these questions, I think that's a, a rapid uh, and feasible takeaway that can make a difference in, in, in those people's lives. I would just say what he said. <laughs> Uh, gratitude. Um, I think Gratitude Garden has been uh, mm -hmm. one of the most powerful things that we've done. Uh, and I think expressing gratitude and, and uh, being able to chronicle, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, research to show that the impact of that. So yeah, but what Justin described, I think, is, is probably one of the most important and impactful things we can all do. And it's our responsibility, every single one of us. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring up gratitude, Arpan. I, I'm familiar superficially with Brian Sexton's work at the University of Michigan on three good things. Have you used any of this or what are your thoughts on reflecting at the end of the day on, I think the question is what went well today and what was your role? There's some self-efficacy part of that. What was your role in making that happen? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think just, uh, uh, you know, being able, and again, uh, one thing that we found is if, if trying to be too prescriptive with this does make it hard. So allowing for open and like, you know, we are all grateful about so many things in our lives. We know how to express gratitude. We don't need to teach people how to do that. But I think allowing for uh, an open forum, allowing for opportunities for this to happen intentionally uh, and proactively is, kind of, is, is probably one of the more important things we can do. Thank you for that. Don. Sorry, is on mute. Ask the question again, uh, Jess. What's the next thing that someone should do if they're listening? I tough. Um, I, I can say that uh, for me, the sustaining uh, forces have been family and loved ones. So for those of you who are isolated, that's a problem and we need to figure out how to reach social supports. But I, it's what Justin said earlier, you know, when you, if we need to save the mental space to tune into the people that we, care about and love in our personal lives. And I think that I just can't think of a reservoir of energy that's more important than that right now. I don't know if that's really responsive, but um, it's where I go. I'll mention one other simple thing, which is a physical exercise. This is a time of being cooped up. We don't move around. And uh, Justin will tell us the evidence on relationship between physical activity and mental health and well-being is very, very well established. For, so for those who that, uh, have that option, I really strongly am urge, uh, urge it. It's not, it's, not, it's not an option, it's a necessity. Thank you, and Kezia. I just reflecting on um, the research that we did, I think it's just so important to encourage these conversations to be had amongst team members. I mean, everyone here has said it so beautifully and has given such, um, concrete examples as to what can be done. You know, you, this psychological PPE tool has even more um, actionable examples, but I think just making sure that space is being given for these things and that they're being talked about in earnest, I'm sure everyone on this call cares about that um, even more than I can imagine. Um, but yeah, I think just making the space for these conversations and being able to be um, real and honest with each other and how everyone is feeling and, you know, allowing uh, people to have varying reactions and then to work with everyone um, as a team. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate that folks on the line are making commitments in the chat, actually, of what they're going to walk away and do. Um, I, I want to steal shamelessly from a lot of these. Um, Oh, we're just so tight on time, but there's another question here that I wonder if we have just very briefly, if we could touch on stress for medical and healthcare student training 
right now. Just um, any thoughts about how that's changing and the intersection of these challenges during the pandemic from any of our speakers? I know Arpan's a geriatric psychiatrist, and so he'll be entertained by this story. We, we have, I think, been um, wonderfully impressed by the innovation that comes from our learners. Um, we initially thought and anticipated that uh, in our rapid shift to, to virtual care, that our geriatric psychiatry clinic would be, you know, the, the late adopter. Because, you know, how, how in the world could patients suffering from dementia participate meaningfully in a technology-based encounter? And it was the students and the, the learners that said, well, hey, this is not that hard. Let's just try it out. And they carried the baton. And what we found was quite surprising. Number one, um, this is a vulnerable population, and uh, ones that a population that we that we really wanted to protect from the potential risk of coming into a healthcare healthcare facility or having, you know, uh, interactions with more people than are necessary. And so the the loved ones, the caregivers, were especially keen to make virtual visits happen. And number two, from an educational perspective, um, we got to see through a virtual visit taking place in the patient's home, how the illness was impacting their functioning in their home environment. That's a rich teaching point. That's a rich clinical uh, learning opportunity. And it presented a um, kind of a new source of energy for the, the learners. So we're now doing all kinds of what we're calling telesupervision that's creating uh, neat opportunities to study educational platforms in a way that we never imagined might be a silver lining from this whole pandemic. Thank you for speaking to that, Justin. I, I just didn't want to let that opportunity uh, pass us by to talk about our learners. Um, we have reached the end of our time together today. And as we wrap up, uh, we have a survey opening on the right-hand side. Um, this is super important because it's helping us to figure out the topics for our future sessions, um, which we have a few more. Um, so we'd greatly appreciate your feedback if you don't mind giving uh, it. And if you don't have it open, you can hit the drop-down arrow next to the word polling, and that should open up the, the poll and just hit submit when you're done. Um, I also just want to thank uh, Don Berwick, Arpan Wagre, Justin Coffey, Kezia Imbia, Julia Nagy, Vicki Minden, Matt Morris, everyone that's that's made this um, possible today. And thank you to the audience for not just taking the time to participate in the program, but also just contributing so mindfully to the curation of resources and approaches. Um, be on the lookout for the archived edition of today's show. We're going to post it to IHI.org. A bunch of you has, have asked for it. Um, this special focus of virtual learning hours, caring for caregivers, is a partnership with Wellbeing Trust, and it continues on a bi-weekly basis. Um, our next one will be August 21st, and we'll feature topics, again, related to the prevention, prediction, and mitigation of poor mental health and well-being amongst caregivers, care teams, our workforce. Um, so you can learn more on IHI.org slash caregivers. Um, and while you're there, there's a discussion. So you can um, visit this shared learning page to engage with uh, fellow folks on the line and uh, get support, get real-time solutions to some of these challenges and continue the conversation. Um, Thank you again to everyone, uh, wishing everyone joy and well-being in your work. And from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, I'm Jessica Perlow. Thank you.